you photographed this movie yourself. You spoke to this fact a bit in the introduction. Um, you have filmed some of your films before, but for this film, you served as the, the cinematographer for the entire feature. What inspired this um, greater, let's say, intimacy with the camera and with the subject for this film? Uh, there were various reasons. Uh, one, of course, was uh, I wanted to be unobtrusive, invisible. Uh, we were, it's a small camera uh, with 4K, but very good plugs for uh, radio mics or other mics. Very professional. And it's so small and so unobtrusive that I was filming in the middle of the streets in Tokyo and nobody of the people who were walking by even noticed that anyone was filming, was filming a feature film. Of course, uh, Japanese filmmakers always complain it's very hard to get shooting permit in Tokyo and in some places like the um, uh, platform of the bullet train that's completely invented by, by me, this scene there, like many other scenes. But uh, it's a high security area um, and uh, surveillance cameras all over the place. And I knew I had only one chance to do it. So uh, with the three actors, I rehearsed the scene uh, on a different level. And we were rehearsing among tens of thousands of people milling around. In the middle of them, we were rehearsing. Then we went down to the platform of the bullet train and I looked out, ah, yeah, the train was coming in. That was the signal and I said, go. And they started the scene. The train stops exactly 60 seconds and it takes another 10 seconds until it's accelerating, it disappears. And I knew I had only one chance. And while I was filming 30 seconds into it, I saw with my free eye, there were security, four security guys rushing in on us, but they were confused and they called for backup. And I did the scene once in 70, 70 seconds, put down the camera and we dispersed in all different directions. I'm glad you're speaking to this because I got the sense as an audience member watching this film that there is a real like uh, rawness to the, to the filmmaking, yes. a real spontaneity. And I'm wondering if you felt more liberated in a way making a film in this method than in a, let's say, traditional production. Yeah, sure. It, it was a, a sense of, of liberating yourself, a sense of, uh, of going out there and, and capture what, whatever you, you would find. And so many, many of the uh, sequences are not actually uh, stories that uh, Yuichi Ishii would tell me. I listened to his stories for two afternoons and he helped with uh, casting from his agency with actors and agents. But much, much is uh, invented. Almost all the film is invented that are not part of uh, family romance, daily business, like uh, the excursion to the north and there's a phone call to the wind. And I had heard after the tsunami that somebody put up a phone booth where you can uh, call the uh, family members and friends who have disappeared uh, in the tsunami. And actually people use it and I've seen it. And there's a, some sort of a log book and you write in and you write wishes in for the departed and those have been lost. So it's very heartbreaking. And for example, the oracle, is, she's a very famous oracle in, in Japan and I was so fascinated about this phenomenon and of course i was uh, fascinated by a lottery winner but it's invented who wants to have this great experience once more or for example the hedgehog cafe the bullet train the robot hotel robot hotel fascinated me and i wanted to have it in it uh, not just robot hotel but um, also robot fish in an aquarium not only do we rent human beings, very soon much of it will shift to robots, to companion robots. In The Mandalorian, I played a very small part in it and they had um, a little robot, I mean not, not an automatic robot, it was remotely controlled by two experts who would control the movement, the facial expressions. It was a phenomenal achievement. And I kept saying, look at this, look at this, how it's heartbreakingly beautiful. And 
and it touches your heart, although you know it is a little machine. It's not so much industrial robots. Of course, it will have a lot of future and drones and all sorts of things, robotic warfare that's coming big time at us. But companion robots is something which is uh, very, very big. It will come. And upon learning of this unique client service uh, provided by Family Romance, what was it about this entity that struck you as a great subject, a subject for the cinema and not just uh, something to learn about? Well, the big thing is uh, a fundamental question of uh, human existence. Uh, what is lie? What is truth? Everything in the film actually is in a way a lie or performative. It's a performance. It's everything is staged. Everything is not true and yet it has a truth in it, strangely enough. Of course, we have to ask ourselves about our own lives. How much of our own life is performative? And the real big question is how much truth is in all this and how much uh, is fake sometimes necessary as a benign element for human survival. There was something very interesting, uh, NHK, the Japanese uh, official TV station, did a report on um, Yuichi Ishii. And uh, they asked him, apparently, I don't know the details, apparently they asked him, um, could you give us the address of somebody who has been your client who ordered your service? So he gave them an address. Later it turned out that he was also an actor, an agent from his stable, so just from his agency. And NHK apologized um, in public, which is, uh, which is really a big thing in, in Japan. Um, and now I may invent it now, but it may be the truth. Yuichi Ishii apparently defended himself. If I had given you the address of a real client, he would have been somehow embarrassed about his solitude and he would have given you only half the truth. But sending you an imposter who has done this job 200 times, that one would give you the real deep truth of everything. Now, you're no stranger to working with actors who are, let's say, tasked with blending their uh, off-camera personal being with an on-camera character. How did you work with uh, Yuichi Ishii and the, uh, the young girl, Mahiro? Yuichi Ishii um, helped me with casting on two afternoons from his um, <clears throat> agency. We invited for each part about five different people. And he was so good from behind the camera to engage them in uh, uh, certain scenes and dialogues that I said to him, Ishii-san, you have to be my leading actor. And he said, yeah, well, I'm not an actor, but I, and I said, but that's what I do. I'm a director and I know how to make you a very convincing actor. And he was quite okay with it. And uh, we discovered uh, uh, Mahiro uh, in the second session. And uh, uh, it was just immediately clear to me, don't search any further. That's uh, This is like uh, striking gold. She was so good. But of course, she needed guidance. When she meets him the first time in the opening of the film, he stops her and she has secretly made photos of him. And she says, ah, you are my dad. And so I said, no, 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 we have to repeat it. You are so shy. You are so shy that we barely can hear you. You only whisper, and only later in the film you gain confidence. And only later, um, for example, in, there's a scene in the park where she shows her father the Instagram photos, and she is much more confident. And she, uh, and of course, it goes too far then, too far for an engagement like this because she starts to love him. And what is really a disaster is that uh, her mother also falls for Ishii. So, but of course, this is storytelling. It's my storytelling. It's not what happened to, to Ishii. The concept you've created of this film, to, to make this film, of hiring actors who 
uh, are playing actors who then act themselves inside a, another drama in the film. And this is an incredibly surreal, uh, layered work of, of uh, artifice and, and behavior. Uh, did you ever get lost in what was real and who was acting and what layer of reality was before your camera? Not really, because I I invented all the scenes and I staged it and I described the scene uh, in great detail with the dialogues that had to come. But <clears throat> I never listened through um, some earphones to a simultaneous translation. I wanted to, to be so close that I could sense, oh, this was good now. This sounded authentic. And the funny thing is that uh, some professional reviewers even believe it's a it must be a documentary because it's so authentic. But I think it's a badge of honor, meaning that they are so well directed and they are acting so well that people even believe it's a documentary. And when you're directing a scene and not understanding the original language, is there something that goes beyond language you're looking for from what's before you? Yes, yes, uh, that's a good question. I, I try to look into the soul of, of human beings into the soul of Japan, but it's not only Japan, because <clears throat> this phenomenon about truth and performative life and all this, it's worldwide a phenomenon and, and it concerns every one of us in a way. And I do believe that uh, this kind of renting out um, people who uh, help you along in moments of solitude is going to be big time coming because aging populations in the industrialized countries, they create uh, an, an enormous amount of solitude. And, and I mean existential solitude. And it's very strange because in the beginning of the 1980s, when we had the very first cell phones, I mean, not smartphones, but, but where they were advertising, you can make even a phone call from the beach and call your friends and so on. And I had the feeling and I expressed it and I said, with the explosive increase of um, tools of communication, meaning television, radio, cell phones, uh, and um, internet wasn't there yet really, uh, but, but I, it, it was clear it was coming at us, something was coming at us. We will be um, more connected, but the more we are connected, the existential solitudes will increase. And I said the 21st century, 20 years before it started, the 21st century will be a century of solitudes. And in a world where possibly everyone is playing a role or everyone is renting uh, someone to stand in for another human being, yeah. how can we find out who whose love is true, what relationships are, are, are real? Well, it's as difficult as uh, since the dawn of man <laughs> in my life and until today, there are two things that guide me into the essentials of real life, pura vida, as the Mexicans say. It's not purity of life, it's, it's an essential, saturated, wonderful, full life. And one is, traveling on foot when you travel but nobody does it so I cannot really advise and I mean long distance traveling on foot and I would do it as I'm a lazy bum like everyone else I do it for existentially important reasons I traveled on foot once from Munich to Paris because an old woman my mentor was dying and I wouldn't like uh, to see her die and I, I walked on against it and those are the reasons why I would uh, travel on foot. In the other one, and again, I will speak to deaf ears, is reading. Read. I do not see many films, but I do read. And uh, those who use too much their cell phones and their social media, they don't read anymore. I mean, they read tweets or so, but not cohesive, uh, deep reading uh, of an 800 page Tolstoy novel, for example. So I keep, even to filmmakers and any, anyone who is in medical profession or architects or, or anyone, I say read, 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 read. 
and after that, watch a few movies. On a closing note, if, if you had to use uh, the services provided by Family Romance, what kind of role would you be renting someone to fill? Oh, that's an interesting question. Well, 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 I probably would uh, rent somebody who is seriously into something I'd love to do. I'm, I live in Los Angeles. Uh, nobody speaks my, my dialect Bavarian. I would like to rent somebody who speaks my dialect. And number two, who knows how to, um, uh, how to uh, handle a soccer ball. I would like to go out in the park and kick wildly and swear in Bavarian. <laughs> well, Werner, thank you so much for spending time and thank you for the film and thank you for the discussion. Yeah, and all the best to all the viewers. Good luck to you. Yeah.